So uh, Kyle graduated from the University of uh, California with a degree in uh, bio biopsychology. And uh, after a few years uh, in uh, the pharmaceutical uh, industry, he founded his own company uh, about intelligent chats, uh, intelligent agents um, uh, that uh, for business analytics. And um, he is currently uh, a third or like stepping into the fourth year of your PhD, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, he's interested in uh, uh, robot learning from demonstration and um, um, driven by constraints, which is a very interesting and multi-disciplinary um, topics, I would say. Um, so I, I let, I, I let uh, Carl start uh, with the presentation. Thanks everyone and thanks Carl for being here. Great, Great. Um, let me, I think you might have to stop sharing and then I can, or maybe I can just take over. So. Great. Can everyone see this here? Yes. Let me just get everything a little bit set up. Got the fake laser pointer working. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Sylvia, for the kind introduction. And thank you to Talking Robotics for organizing this seminar series. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for up and coming researchers like myself to network and have an outlet, especially uh, during this crazy pandemic. Um, like Sylvia said, I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, under the advisement of Professor Bradley Hayes. And my talk is titled Robot Learning from Demonstration, Driven Constrained Skill Learning and Motion Planning. So I'll skip over this since I've already been introduced and I'll just jump right in. Uh, so those who are not familiar might be asking, what are collaborative robotics? Um, and so borrowing directly from Wikipedia, cobots or collaborative robotics are robots intended for direct human robot interaction within a shared space or where humans and robots are in close proximity. Cobot applications contrast with traditional industrial robot applications in which robots are isolated from human contact. And so in the picture above here, you can see a human being who is working with a KUKA robot, but you'll notice that there's a pretty serious steel cage separating uh, the human worker and the robot. Uh, and so to cover some differences about how collaborative robot tasks are different from these industrial tasks, I have a series of points here. Uh, so collaborative robot tasks generally require assurances of safety and shared workspace. So in this picture above, this robot might actually be working quite close to the human. These robots must cope with potential changes in requirements such as a rearranged environment. And relatedly, this demands intelligent decision-making and adaptation from these robotics, especially if there's a certain level of uncertainty in the task that they're conducting. And lastly, and in my opinion, perhaps the most challenging uh, is the adherence to human expectations of behavior. And so related to these uh, points, there are some questions that researchers in collaborative robotics generally seek to answer. The first being, how can we enable cobots to cope with potential changes to task requirements? Another is how can we enable cobots to adapt to differences in the environment? And then lastly, how can we maximize human users' belief in the safety and guaranteed behavior of these cobot systems? So my hope is that in the next three topics that I present in this uh, talk here, that I'll cover potential ways in which uh, solutions to these questions uh, can come about. So the first topic that I'll introduce is the idea of constrained robot learning from demonstration. So this is an approach where we augment traditional robot learning from demonstration with additional human provided information, uh, specifically 
uh, behavioral constraints. And the idea is that this will speed up learning, generate better representations of learned skills, and provide assurances of safety. The second topic I will discuss is augmented reality interfaces for learning from demonstration. The idea being to utilize uh, state-of-the-art interfaces that helps facilitate this constraint application for constrained learning from demonstration, while also enhancing explainability and interpretability of learned robot skills. And then lastly, I'll discuss uh, the idea of incorporating and extending constrained motion planning techniques into this LFD ecosystem. And this is uh, intended to guarantee constraint compliance during automated execution of learning tasks. So to jump right into the first topic, constrained robot learning from demonstration. I first want to answer this question here, uh, since some might not be as familiar as, as me. So what is robot learning from demonstration? Well, broadly speaking, this is a suite of techniques that enable layman or naive users of robots to quote unquote, program a robot by example. Uh, this generally requires a numerous number of examples. So you're providing the robot, you know, you know, a bunch of data for it to build the model. And there are a variety of demonstration techniques. Uh, kinesthetic demonstration is where you're physically guiding the robot. Uh, this is generally with robot manipulators. Uh, imitation learning is where the robot sensors are tracking what the human is doing to try and mimic uh, what that human is doing. Uh, that's a very challenging approach since there's a difficult mapping problem. And then lastly, teleoperation in which you just remotely control the robot system. And so a related question is why is learning from demonstration useful? Well, robotic programming requires extensive engineering and software knowledge, and this creates a barrier to automation adoption. And so the intuition is that we can mimic how human beings teach each other. An analogy being how one teaches another human to ride a bike. You might either demonstrate it yourself, you might guide, uh, say, your daughter uh, through the, how to pedal, how to hold onto the handlebars. Uh, and so you're trying to transfer your knowledge and expertise to another person uh, through some mode of demonstration. And so in robotic learning from demonstration, there's often a general pipeline that is followed. So the first step is that you capture a set of demonstration trajectories. And if the model requires it, you need to perform some sort of alignment between trajectories. This is important because it allows you to relate uh, portions of one trajectory to a related segment or point uh, in another trajectory. And so those regions of each of those trajectories might uh, correspond to the same portion of the task that you're demonstrating. And then lastly, you generate some sort of learned model. Most of my research in learning from demonstration focuses on keyframe learning from demonstration. Keyframe learning from demonstration is a technique where you take a set of demonstrated trajectories and you try to learn a sequence of waypoints or keyframes that ultimately provide a course trajectory for the robot to follow. Keyframing can be a situation where the user actually just indicates the waypoints for the robot to follow. Uh, but my research focuses more on learning uh, demonstration, or excuse me, distributions of keyframes that you can then sample to generate a waypoint. So when I first started jumping into learning from demonstration, I asked myself, well, what is wrong with this pipeline? And traditional methods of demonstration have a low overhead uh, and provide a pre precise instantiation. Uh, but this has limited information bandwidth. 
And what I mean by that is whenever you demonstrate a to a robot how to conduct a task, you're really only showing one very precise way of how to carry out that task. And implied constraints, such as a cup has to remain upright and maybe a carrying task, uh, is generally drawn from common sense, which your robot does not have. And so this idea of perhaps common sense from demonstration might require a prohibitively large number of demonstrations, which you probably don't have time for and you probably still shouldn't trust. And so the kind of key insight that myself alongside uh, my advisor, Professor Hayes came up with was the idea that perhaps we could provide additional context during demonstration. And so to recap again, traditional demonstration techniques intrinsically provide a precise behavior specification, but each of these demonstrations only has a narrow coverage of the potential ways in which this robot could conduct the skill. And so in this figure here, you can see below uh, that these light blue trajectories that maybe represent three different demonstrations show that to go from start to goal, you need to go over this obstacle. But the robot system has no way of knowing whether going below the obstacle is actually a feasible and correct way to execute the task successfully. And so the key idea is that perhaps we could have human experts dictate constraints during demonstration. Such constraints could be capable of encoding more abstract context, and they might open up different modalities of information communication, an example being narration. So this leads to an algorithm that I developed about two years ago now called Concept Constraint Learning from Demonstration, or CCLFE. And the key idea is that it augments keyframe learning from demonstration to incorporate human-provided restrictions on robot behavior called concept constraints. So a concept constraint can be thought of as a behavioral restriction that represents a task-specific concept that we then ground as a Boolean operator that classifies whether or not an environment state or robot state is true or false. And so for example, down here, you can see the idea of what an upright constraint might be on a cup object. So you can see here, there is some variance allowed in the orientation of the cup, but once it's tipped over too far, the Boolean classifier would then say that this concept constraint is in violation. And so the idea is that depending on the task that you have, you might have a variety of concepts that are key to successful task execution that can be grounded in more traditional and known constraints like orientation, positional, whoops, uh, kinematic, or maybe even more abstract constraints. And so the key takeaway or the key approach, I should say, of CCLFD is that a user first assigns constraints during demonstration. Now this again could be done through narration if you have a good natural language mapping to constraints, uh, a toggling mechanism, or as you'll see upcoming in the talk, an augmented reality interface. And these constraints are combined together into a formula of uh, these constraint classifiers. You can think of it as a Boolean logical formula of constraints. And then finally, uh, dependent on when and where a human demonstrator dictates a constraint, a corresponding spatiotemporal uh, keyframe will get assigned this set of uh, constraints provided by the user. And what happens is through a mechanism of rejection sampling, we take the initially learned keyframe distribution 
and we perform a rejection sampling technique where we generate a new set of data that is constraint compliant according to the constraints assigned by a user. And then when we execute a skill, we simply sample the sequence of these keyframe distributions, performing another rejection sampling step to ensure each waypoint is constraint compliant. And then this allows the robot to have a course trajectory of a constraint compliant skill plan that we then motion plan through to perform the skill. So the big benefits of CCLFD are increased skill robustness, reduced training requirements, resilience to suboptimal demonstration, and one-shot skill repair. And so as a brief example of how this uh, provides a benefit to a learned skill, here I have sort of a, a proxy of a cup carrying task where the robot is holding onto this cup and this little uh, tape here sort of represents the target bowl, if say it was pouring out liquid. Now in unconstrained learning from demonstration techniques, you are often prone to the robot starting to interpolate to its final state of where it will have the cup tipped over to empty the contents. And if that were to happen too early, then the skill fails. But in this case, if we assign an upright constraint to the portions of the skill before it gets to its target, you can see that the robot maintains the restriction that this cup has to stay upright as it traverses through the learned skill. And so here, finally, it pours out the contents because the constraint no longer applies. Oop, there we go. And so to quantify uh, the idea of one-shot skill repair, we set up a situation where we demonstrated three uh, noisy but just barely successful demonstrations. Uh, and with the stochastic keyframe approach, uh, the resulting model here uh, result, like, could almost never successfully complete the task. And a common way to try and fix a broken uh, learned from demonstration skill is to simply add more demonstration data or just re-demonstrate altogether. But what you'll notice is that as you add more and more uh, demonstration data, the success or skill success doesn't necessarily get a whole lot better. It starts to plateau at a certain point. The intuition behind this is that these initial poor demonstrations have sort of infected the data so that any one keyframe might sample a point that is drawn from the contribution that these poor demonstrations provide to the distribution. And that sample or that waypoint might result in skill failure. But with just one constrained demonstration that say for the pouring task has this upright constraint, uh, we can fix the skill with just a single demonstration and dramatically increase the likelihood of skill success. And so the idea or the intuition again is that these constraints are representing concepts that are essential for the task to be completed successfully. So for those of you who have experience with learning from demonstration and especially kinesthetic demonstration, uh, de demonstration is, is hard. It's not an easy thing to do necessarily. Whether that is the robot is difficult to manipulate if you're doing kinesthetic demonstration, but also users are sometimes simply just intimidated by the robot itself. And now with this algorithm, I'm demanding that users remember when and where to assign constraints. And so I came up with this idea that perhaps we could reduce user burden by suggesting potential constraints to apply to the model. And so the idea of autonomous constraint suggestion is that the attention should remain on the most important constraints of the task and the demonstration of the task itself. 
and that certain types of constraints are learnable from demonstration data, perhaps simple ones that involve orientation and position. And then through some interface, we could have the robot learner prompt the user to reject or confirm uh, potential constraints that it should assign to the keyframe. And so I call this ACCLFD for Autonomous Constraint Suggestion for CCLFD. And it augments CCLFD by automating constraint prioritization and assignment when that is feasible, which then allows the user to validate or reject that constraint assignment. So this algorithm is developed and it can learn potential constraints assuming the user provides decent demonstrations. And a human subjects trial is in design to quantify its usefulness. So CCLFD and ACCLFD enable richer information exchange between humans and robots. However, the question still remain is that how do we know, or how does a human collaborator know that a robot has successfully learned a skill? And as it relates to ACCLFD, how can we validate these constraints uh, that the system might suggest in an intuitive manner? And this relates to a common problem across AI machine learning and human computer interaction. You have some set of training data and in this case, these will be the constrained demonstrations. That training data is then used to train some learned model through some opaque learning mechanism, which then produces some sort of output. In this case, it's robot output, but this could of course be a classification, um, a clustering step, what have you. And so the challenge is that, oh, sorry. So, the idea is that maybe through augmented reality, we might be able to provide visualizations for the user to know that a model has been successfully learned and perhaps even be able to validate or reject uh, suggested constraints. And so the idea again is that 2D and 3D interfaces can provide insight into this learned model thereby providing a mechanism or form of explainability. And so using augmented reality, for example, the user might see whether or not the robot has learned the constraints or will adhere to constraints and perhaps provide a preview of the plan execution path of the robot. And of course, again, relating back to ACCLFD, this interface might allow a human user to reject or accept suggested constraint applications. So as you can see here in this example picture, we have an augmented reality overlay through a Microsoft HoloLens that is showing the planned uh, end effector positions, so how the robot is going to carry out the task visualizations of constraints themselves. So this here is a height constraint. And then whether or not any individual end effector position is violating the constraints that has been assigned to that specific keyframe. So this leads to a system that we call ARC LFD uh, for augmented reality for constrained learning from demonstration. This is developed by myself and my colleagues, Matthew Lubers and Connor Brooks. And so again, ARC LFD is an augmented reality system built upon CCLFD and the Microsoft HoloLens SDK for producing visualizations of learned robot skills and constraints. This system supports this iterative process to verify, repair, and edit existing skills using augmented reality by, again, visualizing constraints, uh, providing users editing menus, and seeing, again, how the robot is going to execute a skill. And so this graph here uh, shows the interaction flow diagram uh, of the ARC LFD system. A user will provide a set of demonstration trajectories that may or may not include constraints which produces an initial keyframe model. The system then provides visualizations of representative robot waypoints, which shows how the robot will execute the skill 
and shows whether or not the executed waypoints will adhere to assigned constraints. If the user is unhappy with the learned model, they can edit and generate new constraints and assign those to any keyframes that they so choose. This then prompts a relearning procedure where the CCLFD algorithm rebuilds a new learned skill that then is presented to the user again. And so they're able to iterate through this process to shape the skill as they see fit. And once they're happy with the resulting skill, we can then just have the robot execute the skill according to that learned model. And so the broad idea behind this system was to provide a way to let human operators intuit the learned model of the CCLFD algorithm, as well as a mode of interaction to both assign constraints and reject constraints as well through the ACCLFD setup. So jumping into the third topic, CCLFD, ACCLFD, and the ArcLFD system all enable richer forms of learning from demonstration and human-robot interaction. But these implementations and most LFD algorithms rely on unconstrained motion planners or simplistic interpolation methods to move through these waypoints. CCLFD demands that motion plans between keyframes maintain constraint adherence. And so this leads to the idea of integrating constrained motion planning into learning from demonstration. So as a quick preliminary, I'm going to do my best to describe what exactly is a constraint manifold and then lead into how that relates to constrained motion planning. So a manifold is a topological space with the property that each point on the manifold has a neighborhood that is homeomorphic to Euclidean space of dimension n. So in one way you can think of that is that at any point along the surface of this topological manifold, you can think of it as being locally Euclidean. And manifolds can represent restrictions of an agent slash robot configuration, assuming that you have a system of constraints that evaluates those states for adherence. So in other words, you can think of a constraint manifold as the set of robot configurations or environment states of the, all the feasible robot states or environment states such that those states meet some sort of constraint criteria. So as a visual example here, you can see that the constraint on this 2D three degree of freedom manipulator is to maintain contact with this line. And all the uh, joint angles, the three different joint angles that meet this criteria are represented by these blue volumes here in the overall configuration space of this toy example. And so this leads to the idea of constrained motion planning. And constrained motion planning is a fundamental problem in robotics and beyond, you know, including driverless cars. And the goal of constrained motion planning is to find a trajectory of controls or states such that the agent adheres to a spe specified set of constraints. And in an ideal world, what this means is that we would be able to find a path on this constraint manifold that is representative of the constraint set in order to achieve this goal. The big challenge in constrained motion planning is that having an analytical definition of this constraint manifold is generally unknowable or infeasible to find. And so there are two main approaches to solving uh, generating a point on this constraint manifold. And the first is a projection method. 
So the idea is that we take an arbitrary point in our robots configuration space, and perhaps we sample from say task space, which you could then run inverse kinematics to uh, map back to configuration space. But the idea is that we generate some semblance of a distance to constraint adherence. This is generally done in task space because representing constraints in task space is often easier than representing them in configuration space. And if we can map this distance back to the manifold or configuration space, then we can use an iterative process or a gradient descent uh, algorithm to slowly project this sample down onto this constraint manifold. You can think of this as a first order retraction of free configuration space onto the subspace that is the manifold. And this approach was championed by the late Mike Stoneman and Dimitri Berenson in an algorithm called Constrain Bidirectional Rapidly Exploring Random Tree, or C by RRT2. And so the idea is you have a starting point and you perform the traditional tree expansion of RRT, but every point that you extend to has to be projected down onto this constraint manifold. And so by creating a sequence of points using this approach, you then are generating a trajectory that is constraint compliant. Another approach that, sort of, that extends this projection method, but also uh, relates back to the very definition of what a manifold is directly is the idea of approximating the actual manifold surface through something called an atlas. And so what you do in this case is you use a tangent space around a projected point as a local Euclidean approximation of the manifold surface. This is known as a chart. And so if you refer to this picture over here, you can see that if, say, our constraint manifold was this sphere, and we're trying to plan a trajectory on this sphere, any single projected point, say right here on this panel, can have a tangent space off of that sphere that is representative, representative of that local Euclidean uh, perspective. And the collection of all of these charts constitutes what is called an atlas. And if you can generate enough of these charts, then you start to generate a full approximation of the manifold surface itself. The advantage to this is that rather than sampling individual points, once you have a good enough coverage of your manifold, you can then perform traditional sampling techniques where now instead you are sampling these tangent spaces, which allows you to much easily or much more easily sample points from that tangent space as opposed to projecting down every single point. And so this approach uh, is called Atlas RRT, developed by Leonard Jaye and Joseph Porta. And so as this relates to CCLFD, again, we want to be able to have the robot motion plan from keyframe to keyframe while adhering to a set of constraints. And so these methods might enable uh, CCLFD to do so. But likewise, we can also think of CCLFD as serving as like a model for a motion planning problem that has changing constraint sets. So most of these techniques uh, for constrained motion planning only think of a single set of constraints that applies to the start and end of your planning problem. But in a keyframe model, there's multiple different waypoints that this robot might be traversing through. And along that traversal, the constraints themselves might be changing. 
And so I propose that we can think of the CCLFD keyframe model as now a planning graph itself. And what we do is we sample starting and ending points from keyframes as the nodes of this planning graph. And the edges between these points will hold on to the trajectory distributions to bias sampling and also be used to determine which constraints have to apply for that particular segment. And then this allows us to traverse from node to node uh, using these constrained motion planning techniques uh, for guaranteed constraints compliant uh, trajectory execution across the entire skill execution. And so some of the benefits of this approach are that users can adjust constraints, which only requires specific edge replanning and not start to end replanning. So if a user were to say, you know, the end effector should instead now maintain this orientation, perhaps through the ARC LFD editing interface, then we would only need to replan between these constraint keyframes and these here. This also allows us to sparsify our keyframe representation and perhaps only consider just modeling keyframes as these constraint transition boundaries. What this allows us to do is perhaps insert collision objects or changes in the environment that the robot can utilize a constrained motion planner to still maintain constraint compliance. And then lastly, uh, this planning graph and the resulting generated trajectories can act as a precursor for training some of the more recent and advanced learning-based planners by successfully generating ground truth data for changing constraint set planning problems. You can think of this as a planning problem that has implicit rayonomic constraints. Rayonomic constraints are constraints that have some dependency on time. And in this case, these constraints might be conditioned to have some sort of on-off step function about when constraints apply during skill execution. And so my hope throughout this talk is that I gave you an idea of how constrained learning from demonstration enables a richer mechanism to build better representative skills that adhere to these high level requirements as concept constraints that the user might assign to a model. The idea behind augmented reality interfaces is that we can then enhance the explainability and interpretability of learned robot skills and also facilitate constraint application. And then I hope that I illuminated how constrained motion planning is essential for CCLFD to be successful, but also in turn show that representing a planning problem using the CCLFD model also helps benefit constrained motion planning. And that is the end of my talk. So I am certainly welcome for the upcoming discussion. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. So how did, how did I do on timing? <laughs> no, it was it was great. We have little time, but uh, I uh, remind to everyone that we have a Slack channel, and uh, if you, Carl, want to join, uh, you can also click on the link that uh, has been shared before. I can share it again here. Yes, exactly. Thanks, uh, Miguel. Uh, so that we can continue discuss about uh, your presentation because it was really dense uh, and you really did a lot of work on different uh, things. I mean, they are all col uh, connected and mm -hmm. uh, I can see the, the field rouge among, uh, and you made us understand what was the, the process. And that was really interesting because I think even someone that uh, is not uh, into this topic uh, had the possibility to um, understand a little more and to to follow the presentation. That that's something that uh, uh, that's great. Um, awesome. Yes, um, but but yes, I think we have a little time. So uh, if you have question, please ask. Uh, do you have any question? <laughs> 
Um, I'm jumping into the Slack channel, so hopefully, uh, and so which are... No, but now the question will be like, like uh, we have 10 minutes uh, for, for live questions. So if you uh, have any question, I'm asking to the participant now. Please feel free to ask. Don't be shy. You can also write on chat and uh, we can also ask uh, for you. Okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, I put everyone to sleep. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I have so, a question. Okay, yes. nice. Go ahead. Uh, hey, Carl, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Cool. So I had a question on the last part, which you were talking about constraint plan graphs. So mm -hmm. you told about the way you can eliminate the keyframes, which would like lead to the... Yeah, the second one. So uh, this would lead to ignoring of certain keyframes, right? So my yeah. question is like, what is your take on the smoothness of the planner? Because like you are ignoring certain keyframes. So what are the, because keyframes kind of adds kind of smoothness to the motion planning. And if you're trying to remove certain keyframes, how does that affect towards the smoothness of the planning or something from the perspective of the user, like would it look kind of a little jarring or something? Just want to get the idea on that. Yeah, so I would maybe correct you and say that the smoothness that you get is not necessarily dependent on the keyframes themselves. I think the more appropriate perspective is that when you have a keyframe model, say like this in this sort of simplistic representation, we have a set of constraints that every corresponding keyframe waypoint up until this next uh, set of constraints, these all have to follow this constraint, C, this constraint C1. And what the intermediate keyframes, their real purpose, um, is yes, it sort of gives a, a course trajectory for the robot to traverse, but more importantly, what these intermediate keyframes really represent is adhering to the nature and style of the demonstration data that the user provided. The reason that you might want to sparsify your representation is that if there is some change in the environment that would occlude these keyframes from even being successfully traversed, you still want to come up with a mechanism that allows you to reuse this learned model. And so if you push your reliance on skill execution away from these intermediate keyframes and more towards constrained motion planning, then you might be able to adapt to new collision objects, new environment arrangements uh, that otherwise would be challenging if you really intended to traverse from these intermediate keyframes. The smoothing uh, aspect, you would hope that the motion planner itself, you know, has some built-in optimization or smoothing technique that allows the motion planner to still remain constraint compliant, but perhaps also produce a reasonably smooth trajectory as it traverses to the next keyframe and then the next constraint set. Does that answer your question? Yeah, just to refrain. So basically what you're saying is removing keyframes does not affect the smoothness, but it will add uh, flexibility and robustness because you have an options to do many other things. Exactly. And so, you know, if the user decides that, you know, there isn't really a change to the environment and that they really want, whoops, they really want the robot to adhere to the original style of the demonstrated skill, then you can retain these keyframes. If you only really care to have the skill representation that is considering these constraints, 
and you're less concerned about the exact manner by which the robot carries out the task, then you can sparsify this model and still retain successful skill execution because these constraints are providing a much richer context for the robot to execute upon. Great, thank you for the answer. So now we have a question from Mattia. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the talk, really cl crystal clear. My question is on the constraints for the first paper that you presented. Yeah. So the, the user can, let's say, narrate constraints or add them in uh, diff with different modalities uh, on top of the demonstration they provide. Yeah. How are these constraints uh, known to the robot? Are they like beforehand, like okay, we are gonna we are we are gonna need, for example, a, a keep orientation fixed constraint and uh, another constraint, let's say, stay away from um, the table constraint. So how how are these constraints insert in the in the in the learning process? And uh, yeah, let's let's start with yeah. this. No, that's a great question. So let me jump to I have some extra slides here. And so this like sort of outlines the procedure more in detail of the CCLFD <laughs> algorithm. But as it relates specifically to your question, constraints are the they're like a set of classifiers that I've programmed and built myself but that can be parameterized uh, during demonstration or again, using the ARC LFD interface. And so the idea of like, just to give an example of an orientation constraint, specifically say for an upright constraint, the way that I've constructed that is that there is some sort of ideal vector of mm -hmm. orientation that represents like perfect uprightedness, so to speak. And then I allow for a parameterizable cone around that vector that within which, you know, upright is valid. And if it deviates outside of that, you know, the angle of deviation uh, is outside of that cone, then it's rejected. And so these constraints right now are you could think of them as being partially hand engineered, but through say a narrative interface or an augmented reality interface, those partially hand engineered constraints can be parameterized by a human user. And then that human user then decides when and where on a demonstration or post hoc say with ARC LFD, they can assign mm -hmm. those constraints onto a sort of naive, constraint naive uh, keyframe model. Does that help answer your yeah, question? It answers my question. Yes, thanks a lot. You can go, Kim. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks, Carl, for this uh, really interesting talk. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about how you know humans can give richer demonstrations to robots, and certainly you know in the context of um, safety, I think the idea of constraints is is very attractive and makes a lot of sense. Um, my question is, you know, in cases where you don't really care about hard constraints, um, but you care maybe about a softer version of these constraints, such mm -hmm. as you have a preference for something as opposed to you really want to make sure. Um, a specific configuration of the arm is not reached or some other form of hard constraint. So is there a way you could extend your framework to maybe a more general formulation that would take maybe a modified cost function or some other representation of um, maybe penalizing certain areas of the, of the manifold as opposed to uh, making this a constrained optimization problem? So, the big challenge um, with at least the current setup of these constrained motion planners is that they all generally utilize this algorithm right here. 
because in some way or another, you need to either be able to project every point that you sample down onto this manifold to be constraint compliant, or you need to get one projected point and then use this you know, atlas-based approximation technique. The big challenge with these approaches is that, again, because in configuration space, you don't really know which distance metric to use and therefore how far away you are from a, being on this constraint manifold. And therefore you would struggle to use any sort of gradient descent techniques. What these approaches do is they generate uh, some sort of displacement from a constraint by taking a sample and like the set of uh, constraint requirements and you and think of that sample as being in what is called task space. So, you know, in a configuration space, you have the seven dimensional vector that represents a robot joint, but a task space might just be like X, Y, Z position of the end effector and its roll pitch yaw orientation. And that allows you to get a displacement or distance from task space that you then uh, project back onto uh, the configuration space. So you try to map this error, this constraint distance error into configuration space. And so kind of relating to your question, the, one of the big challenges is finding an appropriate way to express, oops, excuse me, um, how far away you are from a constraint. One approach that I've thought of to soften up the re constraint requirements is to use some sort of Pareto optimization, where instead of strictly adhering to being on a constraint manifold, you try to be on like the Pareto optimal front of maybe a system of constraint objectives. Uh, but that might not give you the guarantees that this method produces. But I, again, the trade-off is that maybe you can be more expressive than you can with the limitations imposed by this sort of distance requirement. Does that sort of help illuminate your question? Yeah, I guess my question, I, I guess, yeah. I guess my question is like when you know humans start using this uh, type of system and they go crazy with their constraints and it, mm -hmm. it would just result in infeasible motions, uh, we would still want a way to accommodate maybe maybe a ranking on the constraints where like some constraints are more important than others would be kind of the first step to go. But I can kind of imagine this scenario where the human wants so many things that the robot will just say, well, sorry, I can't do it. And then that's it, mm -hmm. right? Like the interaction ends. So and, yeah, and, this is where my question is coming from. Right, and like that's sort of why I've been looking at like per, you know Pareto optimization for constraint adherence because you could like one of the examples that I use is like the rescue robot, right? And you know maybe it, you send this into a building on fire, you know, however many years into the future that this is actually feasible, and. The idea is that, of course, this robot is going to have a constraint that says you are not supposed to go into fire or you want to limit that as much as possible. But at the same time, you might have an objective uh, that says like you need to rescue as many people as you can. And so suddenly, if you were to treat this problem as this sort of Boolean yes or no approach that I'm currently using to express constraints, you would immediately come into conflict where the system is so over constrained that it just decides I can't complete the task. And so by treating constraints themselves as an objective that you can partially optimize for in a Pareto optimization type perspective, that maybe you can, based on like the coefficients that you decide to place on each of your objectives in this uh, optimization function, maybe those could be drawn from human design or, or human input. And then this gives a mechanism for the robot to decide how much risk it poses 
to itself based on some soft constraint in order to be able to complete this task. Um, and that's something that I, I hope that I have time to in the next year or two to, to address or you know maybe after I graduate. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Kyle, again, and thank you, uh, everyone. I will uh, share one um, um, one last slide uh, to introduce the next uh, speaker, and then I um, ask everyone to join the, the Slack channel because there are other questions coming. So it's the discussion will continue there. Okay. Great. Uh, no, this is not what I want. Okay, nice. So our next session will be with Glenda Hannibal from uh, Vienna University of Technology, and uh, she will uh, um, discuss trust in uh, human-robot uh, uh, interaction. So. I hope to see you all and uh, thank you again everyone for joining this session.